Look at that bright sunshine. Woo, children alike. Part two. Eric, let's take off where we left off. Didn't quite get through that. It grew dark. Okay, so we're talking about Zydeca. Not Zydeco. That's a type of music from Louisiana. We should probably get a uh, sample of that and have it playing. Zydeco music. Pretty interesting. Pretty complex. Anyway, the we're talking about Zydeca. Three letters in Hebrew. Well, I'll write it down in a minute. Anyway, the point is it's on page 541 of the Red Dictionary. Zadi Dalit Kuf, or sometimes it would be Zadi Dalit Yod Kuf, Zadik, or Zadi Dalit Kuf Hey Zadika. So Zadi Dalit Kuf means to be just or righteous, justified, which is to say acquitted of guilt, declared innocent. Zadik, it's, Zadik itself, it means justness, correctness, righteousness, justice, salvation, deliverance, and victory. Typically, you might think just, well, the word Zadik means righteous. But it's also salvation, deliverance, and victory, which is to say, embedded within the construct of the Hebrew language, I believe that the words are defined and the spelling of the words are built on purpose by Yahweh our Elohim the creator the designer of the Hebrew language in order to show us the mechanics of the universe as we contemplate the spelling of words that's fundamentally at the basis for the whole study of Hebrew and the reason for suggesting that people learn Paleo-Hebrew is to understand how the universe is built so that they can intentionally, proactively, with purpose of their own self-initiative, live, behave, think, and have a, an, expectant, an expectant hope for their future in this world and in the world to come based on exactly what the Hebrew language says. And when I say what it says, it means by definitions of words that you can find in the scripture and in analyzing the spelling of the words. So, to suggest that somebody learns Hebrew is not just learning how to speak a foreign language. It's to get a grasp on science, history, psychology, philosophy. It's to see from, you might say, from the source itself a, an explanation, a declaration of why do things happen in this world that ends up being recorded as history. They say, if you don't learn from history in the past, you'll recur it again in the future as if, gee, what a surprise. Well, it's not a surprise. It just it keeps happening systematically the same. And if we learn from history, then we're not doomed to repeat it. We can affect a change. And given a set of circumstances like we happen to be in right now, the, quarant the worldwide quarantine shutdown of economy, how can anybody recover from this? There's a few options as to how we might re recover. One option is, boy, this thing blows over and whew, shake it off and business as usual. Just pick up where we left off back in December, January, February, and uh, come um, May, June, July, we just uh, it looks it'll just end up looking like a snapshot view of what it used to be. And there was a little hiccup, a little dormant period in the middle, and everybody will forget it by this time next year. That's one scenario, and the people who supposedly know are telling us that's not going to happen. There was somebody who sent a, a video yesterday that said in 2012, some German scientists analyzed the possibility of a worldwide pandemic, and so they were trying to postulate 
if you if 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 that could happen, what would it look like, and how would it work? How would it go down? Well, it would have to be a, a SARS type coronavirus because that's coronavirus COVID is a design of a type of virus, and it would have to start in a Chinese food marketplace, and then spread to Europe, and then spread to the United States, and it'd be worldwide, and blah blah blah. And this is this is the way it would progress. It's like it's an exact script of what's happening, and that was eight years ago in 2012. So the person who put this video up with this interview from this, uh, it's all written in German, but there was charts and graphs and it was rather complex. And they're saying, they knew this was coming. They designed, they, somebody designed this on purpose to accomplish a task. So the task was not just to have an, a, a little interim hiccup and go back to business as usual. It was to create a new world order, a new worldwide currency perhaps, a new way of doing things, whatever that looks like. So we could say, oh man, there's a captain of this boat and he's driving us into the ground on purpose. He's trying to wreck the boat, maybe, or maybe he's just trying to change his course. Maybe somebody's just trying to crash the economy so they can change the structure of things so they can get wealthier. You could imagine a number of different things. The benefit of learning Hebrew, though, is that when you see that Yahuwah himself says, let me tell you how to affect a change. Let me tell you that regardless of what supposed big shots are doing what, on purpose, deviously, behind the scenes, it's not their game. It's Yahuwah's game. And it's not being run by the devil or some other power. Yahweh is the only Elohim who has any power, any influence, any effect. And as we were reading in 2 Chronicles 6, if you think about these words very deliberately, Yahweh says, speaking to Solomon as he was dedicating the temple, if, so it's conditional, my people, if you're not Yahweh's people, this doesn't concern you. Second Chronicles 7. Second Chronicles 7. Yeah. If my people, who are called by my name, well, if you're his people and you have no regard for his name, it's not talking to you. In other words, you may pray and you may have a relationship with him, and that's all well and good. But this particular passage, if my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways then I will hear from heaven. So you have to be one of the people who does all those things in order for that particular passage to be engaged as a formula for his involvement in that regard. Now, I'm not saying he doesn't regard anybody in any other regard, but in this particular regard of listening from heaven and healing our land is set up and qualified by that list of six contingencies. So if you want to have your voice heard in heaven and then affect the world, affect our country, our city, you might want to double check yourself, your own heart, and go down that checklist and see to it that you conform to the standard. Otherwise, your voice doesn't count. It's like voting. If they say, okay, you have to do a certain few things in order for your vote to count, and you go, I'm not going to do those things, but I'm going to vote, and it's like, like some countries suggest you have to be a citizen, and if you're not a citizen, your vote doesn't count. Well, this list of what Yahweh said is the basic requirements to have your voice count, at least in terms of whether or not he should heal our land. And then you can look through other verses and say, well, what are the conditions for his listening to us anytime? It may not be what you've heard. Your pastor may not be telling you the truth. And I say that because there's numerous verses in the scripture where Yahweh says his shepherds, the ones that are supposedly there in his name, are in it for their own gain and they're not giving us his words. And when I say that, I don't necessarily only mean present tense, but this is throughout the last 3,000 years of history book of Isaiah goes back to 600 BC, more or less. book of Deuteronomy goes back to 
1500 BC, pretty much. So what do we do? How do we, how do we make our life count significantly? Well, if you knew that if you did X, Y, and Z, your voice would be heard on high, that Yahweh would take your vote into consideration when he was determining what he would do or what he would allow to be done on the face of the earth. And if you said, well, I'd like, I'd like to offer a suggestion. Hey, uh, would you please do this or would you please bless that? Would you please cause it to rain over here or please whack this guy for being a jerk over here? If you want your voice to be heard, there's a few things you need to do. And if you read the scripture, you'll find out what those are. And if you say, well, I don't care what it is. I'm just going to go rat, 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 and talk to him. That's like, well, you're talking to yourself. It's bouncing off the ceiling. I mean, there's, the, having a relationship with Yahuwah as a vote has to be according to his terms. That, that's why the Bible was written, is for us to understand that there is a structure and a very real dynamic. And it's not just believe in God or believe there's an afterlife or believe that there's spirit entities. There's a lot of different religions, a lot of different myths and fables and beliefs on the face of the earth. And according to the Bible, the scriptures, some people don't like it called Bible. According to the, uh, the writings from Yahweh that he gave to his people Israel, he's the only one. And his ways are the only ways. And again, the problem with translations is that it's not what he said. And the only way to know what he said is to look at it in Hebrew and analyze it word for word, letter by letter. Then you'll know what he said. And even then, we're still trying to struggle to figure it out. But it's so easy that there's pictures that mean things. So we're going to look at the word Zadik, Zadikah. Now, if you look in the dictionary, page 541, it says, Zadik is the planet Jupiter. Jupiter? Why is it called Jupiter? The, apparently, the Hebrew language calls that planet Jupiter Zadik, or Zedek. It says it's the planet of righteousness. But the word Jupiter is the name of the Roman chief god, otherwise known as Jove, or according to the Greeks, Zeus. And then some people say, don't, I shouldn't have even said those words, you're not supposed to mention them. But, as we said on another occasion, which I could elaborate on, which I won't do right now, is that I believe that both the word Jove and Zeus are modifications of the word spelled in Paleo-Hebrew, yod Hey vav Hey. And I say Paleo because the letter Z, as in Zeus, and the letter E, as in Zeus, looks just like yod Hey. Same exact letter shapes. Only one's Hebrew, Paleo-Hebrew, and the other one's Greek. So it's obvious that that's where it came from. yod Hey vav Z-E-U. And then the S is Greek masculine singular, the Greek suffix. It's like, well, it was supposed to be yod Hey vav Hey, but the Hey in Hebrew is the feminine suffix. Why would the name of the Father, Elohim, have a feminine suffix? Well, why should the word Shaddai be referenced to the female body part? What? Things can get confusing. Anyway, let's go on with Zadik, Zadika. If we do Zadika, we get the victory, salvation, and deliverance. Well, wait a minute. If salvation and deliverance comes because of Yeshua being crucified on the cross for our sins, there's no mention of Yeshua being crucified on the cross for our sins in the letters Zadi, Dalit, and Kuf. Remember, him being crucified is Vav Zion. Got nothing to do with Zadi, Dalit, and Kuf. Kuf is our letter Q. Z Zadikah here, it means righteousness, justice, deliverance, victory, and merit. It also is alms and charity. Alms and charity is giving to the poor, helping the widow and the orphan and the downtrodden virtue and piety, Zadikot. Zadikan, Zadidalit Kufnun, is a righteous or pious person. But yet the scripture says there's none righteous, no, not one. But then it also says that 
John the Baptist's parents, what were their names? Wasn't it, uh, was it Zachariah and Elizabeth? Was that yeah. It says they were righteous. And blameless. Righteous and blameless. But yet it says in the Old Testament, there's none righteous, no, not one. So why would the Old Testament say there's none righteous, and then the New Testament say, well, John the Baptist's parents were indeed righteous? But where that's drawn from, Eric, it looks like they'd fallen into that state. If you go back to the original words, uh, said, fallen into that state. Yes, what does into that a state mean? State of un unrighteousness. That the, it wasn't there. Oh, I thought you were previous. talking about John the Baptist's parents. Oh no, 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 no. They, no what they fall into? Where I that mean, no, none, not one, is is pulled out of. If you go back there and read the, read it in context, that they'd fallen into that that state. The point is, we're we're deliberating the meaning of certain passages because the reason this exists is to. Let us know how to figure out how to live this life successfully, victoriously, productively, both in this life and the one to come. Remember hearing a story, some guy died and went to heaven, you know, one of those near-death experiences, and he gets there and he sees streets of gold, gates of pearls, wow, mansions, huge, tremendous, wow, is this my inheritance? No, no, these, these belong to somebody else. And he's going down the street. The houses get progressively smaller and smaller. It's like, is this one? Nope, nope. Hey, this one has a real nice garden. Is this one mine? Nope, nope. And he gets to a cardboard box out in the back galley. Uh -oh. And the guy says, well, here's your house for eternity. What? All right, unfair. What a ripoff. I mean, how come those other guys get those big fancy houses and I get a cardboard box in the back alley? And the, and the angel said to him, you didn't send up any building materials. <laughs> no kidding. Is that the way it works? It seems to. Send up any building materials? What the? Now Yeshua did say, store up treasures in heaven as an active engagement of our energies. Store up treasures in heaven. He says if you store up treasure on earth, moth, rust, and thieves will diminish them. But if you store them up in heaven, they're contained safely in some sort of warehouse waiting for you to get there, if you get there, and you'll have them forever. And you could say, I heard it said, there are no treasures in heaven, that was just some sort of metaphor, some kind of encouragement. The, the, the treasure in heaven is standing in the presence of the Almighty forever, just in a state of ecstasy forever, standing in his throne room, just beholding him, just blown away as a constant status. That is the treasure. That's what was said. Well, is that true? I don't know. I'm not going to argue the point. I've heard it said that. He said, store up treasures in heaven, but there are no treasures in heaven to store up. That's what was preached from the pulpit. Is that true? You can believe whatever you want. But if he said, if Yeshua said, if it wasn't so, I would have told you, then I'm going to choose to believe that the words of Yeshua, the guy that walked the earth 2,000 years ago that they crucified, when he came back to life, when he resurrected, that was the proof that what he said was the truth. And that everybody said, he did not, he didn't come back to life by his disciples. Told. Well, they're liars then. If he really came back to life and walked around as proof that everything he said was true, then everybody who said he didn't is a liar. And if you're lying about that, stealing the truth from people's ears makes you a thief, a robber, a liar, which means you're trying to get those people to not find life, which means you're essentially a murderer for an eternal <coughs> status. So to lie about Yeshua that he didn't rise from the dead makes you a, a thief, a liar and a murderer, or a rabbi, I mean a, a, okay. a false teacher, and I say that affectionately not to kick around the Jews, but to say if the Jews make it their basic teaching that this Yeshua was an infidel, a heretic, a man of great sin, and he's even now being punished in the depths of hell most extremely, and if that's not true, they're liars, thieves, and murderers, and not to be trusted. And so when people say, well, the Christian church has lied about stuff, so 
How do we figure out what these Hebrew words mean? Well, go ask the Jews. They know. Listen to the rabbis. They know. Only they lie to you. I'm not saying all of them. I'm not saying all Christian pastors lie. I'm not saying all professors lie. But what I'm saying is, this is serious matters. And you better be careful who you trust. Don't trust me. I'm just trying to find these words. But you better not go just trust the traditions of the Jews or the traditions of the Christians. I mean, you can listen to Protestants and they'll tell you where the Catholics have blown it. You listen to the Catholics, they'll tell you where the Protestants have blown it. You listen to the Orthodox and they'll tell you where both those guys have gone off track. It's your eternity, your future. You better apply your heart been in lockdown now for what three weeks what lockdown well you know we're <laughs> hunkered in the corner eating stale bread and dirty water and well that's not us is it we've been <laughs> thank you yahweh we've been, been receiving quite a feast these last few weeks brother we're you know we're out here feasting <laughs> yahweh has promised to keep his own well nourished nourished we're providing these videos, especially to an extreme number, right now during this occasion, because how many times are you going to watch the same TV show? You know, some people like watching Andy and Mayberry over and over and over and over because it's a feel-good show. It's opportunity, man. Ephesians 5.16, make the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Here's an opportunity. You don't have to get out and go to work. You know, whether or not the government hands you a $1,200 check, it's like, well, just figure they just bought you a vacation. You can sit here and scour the Internet listening to what people say about Yahweh's words. I mean, if maybe you've never had the occasion before ever in your life because you were very responsible and diligent and had to get up and go to work. Well, now you can sit and listen. Now you can sit and study. A quick shout-out to everybody that's commenting and liking the videos and sharing them. I'm seeing they're getting shared more often. We just uh, salute those people that are sharing his words. Well, I, I appreciate it. You know, on the one hand, it's like, well, I don't know if anybody's paying attention. And some people are saying, yeah, they are. We are paying attention. Please keep making them. And it's not for everybody. It's not Let's for face everybody. it, yeah. So, you know, half the time I'm thinking, well, ah, we got enough videos. We don't have, I don't, I don't need to keep doing this. But people have said, please keep doing this. So... I apologize to people who say, why did this guy just shut up and go away? And it's like, <laughs> turn the channel. Yeah. Hit it. See, that was old, old school TV. Turn the channel. Nobody turns the channel anymore. They push a button and go into another site. You don't like hearing this, go to another site. doesn't matter. But we're trying to do these for the people who say, please keep making them. Here's why this is important. You go to Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 20. And it says really simply, righteousness, righteousness shall you pursue. Now there's a qualification. This is the blessing you get if you do that instruction so that you will live and possess the land that Yahweh your Elohim gives you. Righteousness, righteousness shall you pursue. Zadika, Zadika. trying to see what the word for pursue is, is uh, resh dalit pay, radaf, or radof, zadik, zadik, taradof, righteousness, righteousness shall you pursue, and yet if we don't know what righteousness is, can't do it. So the purpose of this is to say, is he saying pursue righteousness, or is he saying per pursue Victory. Well, if you're saying pursue victory, then you could say, hey, I want to win no matter what, so I'm going to steal things from other people and kill people and inherit, you know, take over their lands. And I mean, that's what happened in the land of Canaan. They took over and drove out the Canaanites, and even this land here used to be inhabited by some Native Americans. Miwoks were up, up the hill. I'm not sure who was here, but uh, this is gold country in California. They came in here, and this, this place used to be pretty heavily forested, and they just cut down all the trees and built towns and railroads. And Is that victory over nature? What does he mean? Well, he goes on to say, 
You shall not plant for yourselves an idolatrous tree, any tree, near the altar of Yahweh your Elohim that you shall make for yourself. And you shall not erect for yourselves a pillar which Yahweh your Elohim hates. Well, what does he mean by that? Well, the first thing that comes to my mind is the Washington Monument. Oh, it, it represents George Washington, number one. The, the, that's also known as an obelisk. The Egyptians had them. In fact, they took the one from the uh, Heliopolis. They, the, uh, did the Romans take it or Napoleon? Uh, maybe it was the Romans. Anyway, the Egyptian city of the sun was Heliopolis, and it was the primary obelisk, sun, uh, sun pillar. They took, they stuck it right in the middle of the Vatican, right in the middle of their front yard. It's got rays of the sun. That's, do not do that. Okay, let's do what he said not to do to prove that we are not subject to these laws. Really? Is that pursuing righteousness? And if there was any question, it's like, what do you have in your front yard? So I would look at this and say, well, maybe there's no law. But maybe there is a law, and maybe I'm not going to stick erecting a pillar in my front yard and carve something on it, even if I carved words of Scripture on the pillar. He says that Yahweh, our Elohim, hates that. So if he hates it, Am I going to figure out a way to get around it? I'm just saying, this is the nature of trying to do this study, is that what did Yahweh say, and what should we then do? There's another verse here, Deuteronomy 20, verse 18, 17. When we get into the land, it says, you will utterly destroy, and he gives a list of the different nations that live there, as Yahweh your Elohim command you, so that they will not teach you to act according to their all their abominations that they performed for their Elohim, their gods, so that you will sin to Yahweh your Elohim. So the interesting thing about that is that we have a culture which appreciates other cultures. So we have museums. And we have photos on the internet of all these other things. I just saw uh, this, this fellow that has patterns of evidence, has these photographs of some Canaanite deities they found in the Israel, in the land of Israel. The, the, the primary city was Jerusalem. The next primary city was Lachish, L-A-C-H-I-S-H, Lachish. It was a built on top of a hill and it was a fort. The Canaanites used it. And you'll read that city a number of times changed hands, was attacked by Assyria and Babylon, and I mean, it, it, this, it was a major, you might say like a garrison city, and they found some, I don't know how big they were, and get, what looked like, the, you know, these little gods that were molten images that were made out of metal, and one was carved into stone, and Yahweh had said, destroy, smash all of them. And it's like, oh, hey, we found, they were doing some diggings, and okay, now we have them on the internet, and we, we show pictures of them, and it's like, yeah, well, it's interesting, but, you know, if, if the Israelites had really smashed everything like they were supposed to, we wouldn't even be able to dig them up and look at them. Ah, but those Israelites, they just didn't have an appreciation. We really appreciate what they look like. So we're going to dig them up. And then you can read, how did the Canaanites worship their gods? And they'll tell you. And say, oh, okay. Say, wait a minute. Yahweh says, do not learn how they worshipped their Elohim. Well, what he really said was, don't learn and do likewise. But... Why should I spend my time looking at the artifacts of ancient cultures and learning the way they worship their gods? When Yahweh says, spend that time that I would have spent doing that, learning his stuff. Now, I'm not trying to put down museums and study, but what I'm saying is, life is a certain number of days that each of us have. Our energy is a limited resource. It's like if your gas tank will hold... 22 gallons of fuel, you've only got 22 gallons. And if you spend three gallons just sitting there running the, the heater and the radio so you can listen to music, well, that might be a nice way to spend those three gallons. But if you needed to travel a distance, you might not want to just sit there idling listening. You might want to use it to get some distance. And so the question is, how many minutes, how many units of mental fuel do you have to apply and if you're going to learn about the names of the Greek and Roman gods and the way the Canaanites worship their deities you could take that same fuel 
and learn the ways of Yahuwah, which counts unto eternity. How do you store up treasures in heaven? Is it just being good to one another? Do you have to be a missionary in a foreign land? Do you have to risk your life? Or is some of it contemplating his stuff? If you read in Malachi 3.16, it says those who had a fear and a regard, a reverence of Yahuwah, gathered together and talked amongst themselves, pondering his Shem, pondering the Shem of yod heh vav -Heh. And again, Shem, Shin Mem, means name, fame, renown, and reputation here, there, occupation of all his concerns. So, being that these words are his Shem, these matters are about what is he like, what is he not like, by making these videos and by people sitting there and talking about them, you are spending minutes and hours, which is an investment into a very specific bank account in the heavens, as far as I can see. You are storing up treasures in heaven. Read Malachi 3, 16 and a few verses following. Yahweh says, take the names of those people that are spending their time on earth thinking about my stuff, write their names in a book, and it's going to be like right here, right next to the throne. And he says, on the day that I, the way it's translated, it says make up or reveal. When Yahweh says, let me show you what's important to me, what I consider my most valuable possession anywhere in the universe because He's the maker and creator of heaven and earth, and everything belongs to him. He says, when I show you my most treasured possession, he's going to pick up those names and he's going to somehow reveal something about them, their condition, their status, their stature in heaven, the tra whatever that is, he doesn't tell us, but he says, you'll, you'll see. You'll see. So it seems to me that you might have a job working on some incredible blockbuster movie in Hollywood, might make a lot of money, might get a lot of toys on earth, might have a lot of fun circumstances. But I would dare to say that listening to a video about Yahweh's stuff is way more important, way more productive, and way more valuable than anything those other movies would offer. The truth is the truth. And even sitting here just talking about the truth is more valuable than any one of those stories of Iron Man flying through the sky and beating up bad guys and shooting laser beams out of a whatever. This is a, a reality of substance. There's a few other things to uh, mention here. In the book of Judges, the Sidonians and Amalek and my own oppressed you and you cried out to me and I saved you from their hand. This is Yahweh speaking to Israel. But you forsook me and worshipped the gods of others. There's Elohim Akrim. Therefore, I shall not continue to help you. Go and cry out to the gods you have chosen. Let them save you in your time of distress. Verse 15, this is Judges chapter 10. The children of Israel then said to Yahweh, We've sinned. You may do to us whatever is good in your eyes, but please rescue us from this hand of our oppressors this day. What we're seeing here is just a random story, Judges chapter 10, somewhere in history, and Yahweh says, listen, let me tell you what's going on. Let me tell you what bugs me. This is what Yahweh's speaking. He said, check out the record. I saved you from these guys, these guys, these guys, and these guys. I, I saved your forefathers. I saved you. I promised to save your children. And as soon as I save them, you go and turn against me and go worship the Elohim Achim, the gods of others. I'm sick of it. I've had it. Fine. I'm out of here. You go call on those other gods who don't even exist, or maybe they do exist as demonic spirits, the devil, and you let them save you when you're in trouble. I've had it. Go ahead and rot. And the people said, no, 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 please, 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 please. And so what did they do? They said, no, please. He can't listen to their voice. You know what they did? They did something about it. The very next verse says, The children of Israel said, We have sinned. May you do whatever is good in your eyes, but rescue us now this day. In the next verse, 16, they said, They removed the foreign gods from their midst. And they served, that's the word obed, ein bet dalit, which is where we get the word obedience and obey and worship. It's all the same word, obed. They, they obeded, Yahweh, then his spirit could not tolerate the travail of Israel. 
Think about this. What this means is that Yahweh is so disgusted with us that he just won't even look in our direction. He says, that's it. I've had it. I'm out of here. You infuriate me. I'm leaving. I'm leaving you to your own devices. And then when his people say, you're right. We messed up. We, we, we blew it. That's the repentant heart. And then they said, what did we do that got him so upset? What did we do that brought this ruin upon ourselves? Elohim Achrim. Dang. Sun idols, astereth poles, rats, what, what? Who put us up to doing that? Well, it, invariably in the scripture, it was the politicians and priests. Put the people up to bringing in the gods of others, Elohim Achrim. And so the people got rid of them. They took them out of their own houses. They took them out of the town square. You know, in this country of the United States, in the last couple years, Somebody, they don't even tell you who, but they intentionally copied an arch from Pergamon, which was the devil's temple. And Obama got inaugurated on a copy of it. Hitler made a copy of it in Germany and held his gatherings there. And people have taken that arch and reconstructed an exact replica and put it, where was it, in Washington and New York and a few other places in this country recently yeah why why are they doing that because whoever is wealthy enough to be able to pay for that and hired the artisans to work on that went and found the most detestable thing against Yahweh as some sort of portal to the netherworld inviting satanic demonic the the devil the the, the whatever and they build this arch and they're hoping to somehow use this as a, as a portal of entry into this country. Why would they do that? Because that's what they want to happen. Apparently when they were building CERN, they were trying to do the same thing. And if you say, no, 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 that's just some Christian woo-woo talk about, yeah, everybody's after the devil. Go, go look at the inaugural theatrics when they opened up CERN. It was all about some European mythology about demonic creatures they they they, they built that place and uh, from what i understand they're still using it in order to open the, the book of revelation in is it chapter 20 says the uh, the devil will be thrown into a bottomless pit a bottomless pit and that there's another place that talks about his demons being chained in the this dungeon of the of the depths of of sheol or hades or Gehenna, or hell of some kind however you want to describe that and these guys the, science, the world scientists collectively, who supposedly scientists don't believe in religion, they got together and say, how do we make a machine, a physical object, that can actually, at the, at the quantum level, at the molecular level of uh, atoms and electrons, release those demons? They're intentionally trying to do what they can to release the demons onto the face of the earth. And that was the theatrical presentation they gave at the opening of the CERN called it a laboratory. These guys believe in a religion, just not going to admit to these words being true. So, but when, regardless of how stupid humans have gone, Yahweh, when he sees his people remove the foreign gods from our midst and do what he said, Obed Yahweh, and how do you do that? You sit down on the Sabbath day and you regard the Moedim, and you learn his language, and you call upon his name, and you read through this text and say, what did he say, what did he say? You do the search, you do the research, you say, what did he say, and let's do it, what did he say, let's do it, what did he say, let's do it. And then it says that Yahweh's nephesh is the word, it's translated his spirit, but it's his, the, his living self could not tolerate the travail of Israel. There's there's something about when Yahweh's people respond, even though we've already just ticked him off so bad he just wants to leave us alone and, and depart from us and let us just go to wreck and ruin, as soon as we, we turn from those evil ways and turn to him and say, look, we did what we said, his heart melts. Look at Jeremiah 31. Ephraim said, bring me back and I'll come back. What do you want me to do? And as soon as Ephraim turns, Yahweh says, gosh, is Ephraim such a delightful child and my favorite son that whenever I think of him, my heart is, grows fonder and fonder? That's the way to 
appeal to him. He tells us this repeatedly. Jeremiah 32, talking about his people. Because of all the evil the children of Israel and the children of Judah, two house, that they committed to anger me, they and their kings and their officers, their priests and their prophets, and the people of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, those are the big shots, the elite that got to live in the best city and the, like, living in Beverly Hills, you might say, or Bel Air or something down in Los Angeles. To me, they turned their back and not their face. And though I taught them, there's that same words, Shakar, to rise early and teach, they did not listen to accept rebuke. They, then he says what they did. This is how they worshiped the Elohim Achrim. They built the high places of the ball. Those are like the sun pillars. They passed their sons and daughters through the fire to Molech. You could say, well, nobody's lighting a fire. And What do they do? They, here's the fire, and they pass their sons and daughters through. Well, vaccines and abortions and the adrenochrome stuff, this is all along the same lines. He says, I never commanded them, nor did I ever contemplate performing this abomination in order to cause Judah the sin. Behold, I shall gather them back. So this is verse 37, and this is what's in front of us. Behold, I shall gather them back from the lands to which I disperse them in my anger, my wrath, and great fury. Yahweh says, because of what our ancestors did and what we have even done in our current generation, he is so mad and disgusted with us that he, in great wrath, anger, and fury, kicked us out of the land and scattered us across the face of the earth. And we read in Deuteronomy 28 and Leviticus 26, with the sword following, with pestilence following, with wild animals, with microscopic organisms. But, Jeremiah 32, 37, I shall return them to this place and cause them to dwell in security. This hasn't happened yet. The world can't end. Well, this hasn't happened. They will be a people unto me, and I will be Elohim unto them, and I will give them a single heart and a single path to fear me all the days, so that it be well for them and their children after them. Longevity, numerous generations. I will seal an everlasting covenant with them that I shall never depart from them to bestow goodness upon them, and I will place my fear in their hearts so that they not turn away from me, and I will rejoice over them to bestow goodness upon them. I will plant them steadfastly in this land with all my heart, with all my soul. For y'all, we were talking about this at the tail end of the video last night. For thus said Yahweh, just as I brought upon this people all this great evil, Yahweh brought the evil, not the devil, not our enemies. It wasn't China, Russia, the United States, Great Britain, France, Spain, Germany. It was Yahweh. So I will bring upon them all the goodness that I speak of concerning them. What goodness did he speak of concerning? It's in this text. You want to know the goodness? Read the text. I will return their captivity, Nam Yahweh. That's the last verse of chapter 32. Thus said, this is chapter 33, uh, Jeremiah, Thus says Yahweh, its maker, meaning the maker of Israel, Yahweh is fashioning it to establish it. Yahuwah, Yodevave, is his name. Call to me, and I will answer you, and I will tell you great and mighty things that you do not know. Verse 7, chapter 33, I will return the captivity of Yahuda and the captivity of Israel, and will rebuild them as at first. I will cleanse them of their sins that they committed against me, and I will forgive all their iniquities that they committed against me, and that they transgressed before me. And this will be for me. Now this is what Yahweh says about him. He's telling us of his own inner heart here. He says, this, this what? When he restores his people to the land that he promised. He says, this will be for me for the sake of rejoicing. You think of Yahweh sitting on his throne. Does he get mad? He says so. Does he rejoice? This is why he rejoiced. He's sitting on his throne. <laughs> this is going to bring him rejoicing. Can you picture Yahweh getting up on the throne and dancing, doing a little jig in the th th courtroom? Th he might trip over that train track he's got sitting up around his, filling the temple. But he says, for praise and per for splendor before all the nations of the earth, who will hear about all the goodness I will be doing for them, that's Israel and Yehuda, and who will fear and tremble over the, all the goodness and the peace that I will do for it. 
never again will be there will be heard in this place about which you say it's destroyed without man without animal mark twain when he went to the the holy land palestine back in the 18 70s was it yeah 1870 he went there and he said this place is a, a ruin wreck <laughs> jonathan khan wrote a book called the oracle and in there he tells you from very interesting things and the day that mark twain got on the boat to send over there lined up with certain prophecies what mark twain wrote though not knowing he was quoting scripture lined up with certain prophecies it's really a remarkable book jonathan khan i think did a really good job at that anyway he said it's destroyed without man and animal. It's completely different now, but that was back in the 100 years ago. In the cities of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem that are desolate without man, without inhabitant, without animal, and the sound of joy and the sound of gladness, the sound of the groom and of the bride, the sound of people saying, Praise Yahweh, Zavot, for Yahweh is good, for his mercy is forever, bringing thanksgiving offering to the temple of Yahweh, for I will return the captivity of the land as at first, said Yahweh. Verse 14, Jeremiah 33, Behold, the days are coming, Nam Yahweh. Remember, Nam Yahweh, that's like this signet ring on a statement that says it must, it cannot be rescinded. When I will fulfill the favorable matter that I spoke concerning the house of Israel and the house of Yehuda, in those days at that time I will cause, here's Zydeca, a sprout of righteousness. Sprout of righteousness, that's the picture of Zydeca. To sprout forth for David, and he will administer justice and righteousness. That's Mishpat and Zadokah in the land. In those days, Yehuda will be saved. Jerusalem will dwell in security. It hasn't happened yet. And this is what people will call Jerusalem is Yahweh Zadokhenu, which means Yahuwah is our righteous one. It talks about the two families Yahweh has chosen. He has rejected them down there in verse uh, 23 24 i will return their captivity and i will show them mercy that's the last verse in chapter 33 so here let me show you something about zedeka zadika if you look it's, it's zadi dalit kuf so if you look at the word that's spelled zadi dalit it means side or flank so if you have here this is the letter Zadi, and it means righteous. In Micah 6, 8, this is the word that's quoted here. He said, He has shown you, O man, what is good and what Yahweh requires of you. Ashat Mishvat. It's translated, do justice, or that's Mishvat, is the balanced scales. Do, just do what's right. If you say you're going to do something, you make a vow, do it. Fulfill your side of the contract with one another. Ahavat Chesed. Love, mercy. That word chesed literally is tender, loving kindness. But het samik is the word for secret, refuge, to be protected. And samik dalit is the word sad or, or sod, which has to do with, again, another way to describe the word secret, which is this foundation. So you could say, well, if we want chesed from Yahweh, which is a word used all the time throughout the scripture, het samik dalit, chesed, tender loving kindness then we should look for the occasion in our life to do that to one another because if the measure we use is measured to us then we have to first do kindness to others to open the door for kindness to come to us so if you want wealth if you want the wealth of kindness of intelligence of finances of provisions of just kindnesses in your life the way this system works is you have to do justice, which is to say realize that the whole world is designed by a balancing of scales, and you can proactively put on your side of the scales of balance that thing that you hope to get. If you want a friend, go find somebody that needs a friend. If you need provisions, give some provisions to somebody who lacks it. That's the way this world works. It's not standing here with an open mouth like a little baby bird going, ah, 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 ah. That's not the way it works. The way it works is realize what you want and then go provide that to somebody with something. Even if it's one little seed, it's like it's springtime and I don't have any seeds to sow. And it's like Yahweh, give seed to the sower. That's another verse. You can ask him to provide you the seeds to sow. Sowing the seeds of love. Soundgarden did a very nice song about that. 
sowing the seeds of love, sowing the seeds of chesed. When you do something, Isaiah 58, for one another, Yahweh will just open the floodgates and pour it into your life. That's the way this works. That's the mechanics of what Yahweh built, regardless of whether anybody's told you that. Do justly, which is to say not just justice, but it's the balanced scales. Understand that there's a way to balance the scales that you can then do proactively engage in and then when you see an occasion to do mercy, it's like love doing this. Like, oh, here's my chance. Here's my chance. Opportunity's knocking. Here it is. So when you see the occasion for mercy, go do the mercy. It's like somebody else says, hey, this guy's just asking to be ripped off. I'm going to rip him off. I've had this happen to me a number of times in life. Somebody says, man, you're just sitting vulnerable. You're not even protecting yourself. Bam, I'm going to take advantage of you. I'm going to take what's yours. I'm going to steal what you have left unguarded. I'm going to... Don't be that person. Be the person that has that same attitude of looking for the occasion to do mercy and then be merciful and then the other one says walk humbly with your Elohim to walk humbly Zadi Nun Ayan is the word humbly the same picture of the sprout the Zadi is a sprout the Zadi lines up with the Ark of the Covenant where Aaron's rod budded coming a dead stick coming back to life Yeshua rose from the dead and if you look at the word for Zadi Dalit it says lateral or something coming out the side uh, Zadi Dalit hey is to lay waste or devastate so you could say well even though Yeshua's body was weight laid waste and devastated he came back to life so that's a prototype model of what we can expect and if I look at the words Dalit Kuf. I can look. Let me just show you. Just real, we're almost out of time here. If I look at Hey Dalit Kuf on page 141 in the dictionary, it means to press together or squeeze or fasten. Now it's a trigger to pull the trigger or to a, a close pin. So I'm just saying I'm putting the arbitrary prefix, the letter Hey, in front of Dalit Kuf just to look at another consideration. And it has something to do with pressing something, pushing. But then if I look at Dalit Kuf. On page 130, and then I can look at Dalit Kuf Kuf on 131. Thin, lean, small, or fine, tender. That's trivial, minute. Thin curtain, eye disease. Dalit Kuf Hey, a balcony? A balcony? What does that got to do with something thin? Dalit Kuf Kuf, to crush or pulverize, beaten, small, or fine. Dalit Kuf Noon, a dean over ten people. Dalit Kuf Av Tav, thin, delicate, fine. So what I'm saying is you could sit there and say, I don't know what to do with this stuff. None of those things make any sense. But then I can look at Dalit Kuf, Dalit Kuf, Dak Dak. Examine minutely to be strict, which is the word, I believe it's pedantic. Investigate, search, crush. In other words, crush something down to the smallest little piece. Letters. <laughs> Letters are the smallest pieces of spelling words, and words are the smallest little bits of explaining profound mysteries of the universe. Dalit Kuf, Dalit Kuf, Noon Yod, meticulous and punctilious. I like that word. Punctilious. <laughs> <laughs> this is a good way. <laughs> Being a punk in a good way. Pedantry. That's that's word pedantic. So this word for the balcony, I'm just trying to show you where the benefit of this dictionary is. It says it comes from an Arabic word, daka, which means flattened sand hill or a stone bench, which means he rammed, stamped, made flat or made level. It's like, oh, it's to take something and pound it so solid that you can stand on it and project even a cantilevered balcony. So by looking at this, it's like crush and pulverize and take something ground to the minutest detail. That's like a, a chemist or a scientist mm -hmm. looking at elements. And elements are composed of electrons and protons. And then the other scientists get down into quantum physics. So this is like going down into the quantum physics of saying, how is the universe built? It's built by saying, righteousness is goodness. For Yahweh is good, for his mercy endures forever. Praise Yahweh. That's Jeremiah 33. You go looking where Solomon was inaugurating the temple and they said over and over again 
Hodu layuaki tov ki lehu lam chazdo. There's an account, another video, I had all these things written about all the times when there was these miraculous interventions that Yahweh did for his people. One time a million man army was routed. Another time 500,000 guys wiped out in a single day. Another time woke up in the morning and 185,000 elite troops dead, laying on the ground. And the, the king, I think it was Sennacherib, had to turn and run back to Assyria and then they assassinated him there. The, numerous times, Yahweh steps in and does things that we just couldn't have imagined. So here we are in this situation and one time the, uh, the priests went out in front of the army of Israel and they were just singing, Hodu la yuaki tov. Hodu la yuaki tov ki le olam chazdo. Or there's that, Hodu la yuaki tov, Hodu la yuaki tov ki le olam chazdo. Let's give thanks with a grateful heart. The point is, our heart giving thanks changes the resonance of the universe which allows Yahuwah to reach in and change circumstances which causes him to turn the curse into the blessing which allows him to do what he has been wanting to do which is reach in and knock down the little chess pieces of the people who think they're running this place on both sides knock them all down and implement what he has been wanting. The throne of the house of Israel, Levites and Kohanim, my attendants. Yahweh wants us to be telling the truth about the way the universe works, about the way this, this earth will work. There's a way that we can play into this and turn the circumstances into what Yahuwah has been wanting to do for centuries by us presently being the generation who repents of our evil, turns to him, trusts his word, gets rid of the Elohim Achrim. If he wants us to sit down on Shabbat, okay, I'll sit down on Shabbat. How many minutes do we have? I'll give you a minute. Okay, here, I was going to show something. We were talking about this last night. The word Shabbat. Oh yeah, I love this. <laughs> <laughs> the word shin, shin, bet, tav. That's an S-H, and that's a B, and that's a T. Shabbat. Sit down on Shabbat. Don't work. Me, 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 me. I don't want to work. Everybody whines about how Shabbat is such a horrible, horrible, horrible thing to have to do. Ain't Sit it? down on Shabbat. This letter Shin is the monogram of El Shaddai. In the, in the modern Hebrew, El Shaddai, Shaddai, Shaddai. The omnipotent, the all-powerful, the provider of all benefits, the one who is the devastator of all opposition. Shin Bet is the word Shuv or Shuv, like Shub. There's a fellow named Scott Shub who's one of the teachers. It means to sit down, it means to return to your house, to dwell, to sit in safety and security. And then there's this word, betav. That's the word for girl, maiden, young woman. It's a village under the cover of a city. So you could say, this is El Shaddai's daughter. El Shaddai's daughter is allowed to sit down on Shabbat because she ain't nobody else's bitch. <laughs> nobody can tell the bot of El Shaddai, <laughs> get up and you do something on Shabbat. <laughs> so anybody comes to you and says, oh, it's Saturday, or it's the seventh day compared to when the moon is, the lunar calendar is another matter. If somebody tells you, you got to get up and do something on Shabbat, not if you're the bot of El Shaddai. And now we got to close it down. We'll have to do another one. Well, I'm glad you oh. got that in there because that was our discussion last night. That's awesome. Somebody, some of those are somebody else's words, not mine. I'm just repeating something I heard. Whoops. <laughs> Sorry, Hallelujah. Mom.